Welcome to Green is Good, raising awareness of each individual's impact on the environment and helping to create a more beautiful and sustainable world. Now, here's John Shigarian, Chairman and CEO of Electronic Recyclers International and Mike Brady. Welcome to Green is Good, Mike. It's so great to be here with you today. Hard to believe another week has come and gone. And, John, I'm looking forward to spending another hour with you and our guests and uh, our listeners just learning what we can do to make the world a better place. Well, this is going to be the New York edition of Green is Good. And on the front half of the show, we've got Jeffrey Hollander making his return to Green is Good, talking about his new book, Planet Home, and the future. So listen to this commercial, then come on back to Green is Good. If a little green is good... More is even better. Now, back to Green is Good with John Shigarian and Mike Brady. Welcome back to Green is Good, and we're so honored today to have on the line with us from New York City, New York, Jeffrey Hollander, one of the rock stars of the whole green revolution. Welcome back to Green is Good, Jeffrey. Hey, my pleasure to be here. Hey, you know, Jeffrey, you are truly one of the, the, the most amazing thought leaders and business leaders of the whole Green Revolution, going back to the co-founding of 7th Generation and leading that company for 20-somewhat years. And way before it was cool to be green, you were the guy. You've written so many books. You've written a new book called Planet Home. Where are we right now in this whole you know, revolution? And what's your outlook on sustainable and responsible businesses? Are we going in the right direction or are we stalled? Well, we are making progress. We're just not making progress quickly enough. Uh, unfortunately, some of the challenges that we face, whether they're global warming uh, or health issues in developing countries, the problems are getting worse quicker than we are mitigating them. Now, again, that doesn't mean we're not making progress and that lots of great things aren't happening, but we have to, uh, to turn it up We've got to do more. We've got to do bigger things. We've got to move quicker to mitigate the challenges that we're facing. So when you say we, I, you know, you, you have such a world approach to everything and a holistic approach. What, when you say we, is it the private citizen? Is it big business? Is it President Obama and big government? Who is the we in this and who's not, who's not pulling their fair share? Yeah. You know, the we is everybody. Uh, okay. it, it, it runs from teachers who are teaching our children to consumers, to politicians, to business leaders. And uh, I'm not sure I would give any of them an A. Uh, <laughs> clearly, uh, from a political perspective, uh, while we have made some progress uh, on important issues like global warming, um, we haven't made progress, and I think we will be unlikely to make much progress during the next two years on a federal level. So there is a, a gridlock in Washington, and the gridlock in Washington is in many respects driven by the uh, miserable uh, behavior of, of organizations like the Chamber of Commerce that is spending hundreds of millions of dollars to stop the progress on behalf of large multinational energy companies. And uh, so, again, while there are companies who are doing exceptional things and, and making real progress, uh, at the end of the day, the money, the energy, the weight of the old economy businesses uh, are really, really, really preventing us from making the progress we need to, to make. So, you know, the business community, maybe we won't give them an F, but we'll give them a D. Um, I think consumers are, are increasingly moving in the right direction. But, you know, one of the reasons that I wrote Plan at Home is too many people are confused about what really makes a difference, where to get started, uh, what decisions are the most critical to make as a consumer and which are the things that are nice to do but not but they're they're, they're not going to add up to the kind of radical change that we need. Well, you know, you brought up the Chamber of Commerce, and this is a this is a great uh, segue into you know the second half of our show today. You're the you're the you're the uh, the front side, and on the on the back side of our show uh, is David Levine and the American uh, Sustainable 
uh, Business Council, which you're a co-founder of and a board member of. Talk then a little bit about the alternative to the chamber, this great organization that you helped co-found. What are they doing then to create change as an alternative to the legacy Chamber of Commerce? Well, the American Sustainable Business Council is an organization of organizations. So we have members at the organizational level like the Social Venture Network or B Corp or uh, Bally, as well as uh, more traditional members like the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce right here in New York. Those organizations represent 65,000 businesses who are interested in seeing progress on uh, regulating CO2 emissions, interested in, in ensuring uh, that wealthy people like me pay our fair share of taxes and aren't getting tax breaks that they don't deserve, interested in seeing uh, us continue to make progress on health care uh, and, and someday pass the public option. So these are businesses who almost invariably really take a different point of view than the Chamber of Commerce. And the purpose of the American Sustainable Business Council is to send a message to politicians uh, and to Americans in general that these progressive initiatives are good for business, are good for job growth, are good for our economy, and don't let anyone tell you that the health care policy that we just passed is bad for business. Don't let anyone tell you that we can't afford to regulate greenhouse gases because we can't afford not to. Got it. So in, in, in some, then, the American Sustainable Business Council, Progressive Chamber of Commerce, wants to maintain the status quo. That's putting it kindly. Kindly. Well, let, let's then go into the status quo, where we are today, and, 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 and big, big, big business. Is there still the problem of greenwashing going on, or have we overcome that yet? No, greenwashing is still a, a real problem, and it's, it's a real problem because uh, while uh, we're moving towards clear guidelines that the attorney generals are putting out, uh, there has been uh, very lax compliance. But, you know, today we live in a world where words like natural just don't have any defined meaning. And so people can use them in any way that they want. And because there is no regulation, uh, words like planet-friendly, earth-friendly, natural, good for the environment, they don't have agreed-upon definition, so companies use them uh, inappropriately uh, and, and are still misleading consumers. So, you know, we need to use, I mean, there's some great tools like the Good Guide where you can uh, enter in the name of a product and get a really comprehensive rating of how green and sustainable the product is. Uh, you can even go into the grocery store and take a picture of the barcode uh, with your, your mobile device, and uh, a couple seconds later, you'll get uh, the same analysis and the same rating. So the good news is that even though there is still greenwashing and significant amounts of it, there are tools that we can use as consumers to help us make better choices. Hey, Jeffrey, I just want to... Uh inject something and ask a question really at the beginning you you had just mentioned the attorneys general don't agree so am i to understand that this is actually down to a state level when it comes to regulating the definition uh, or is it does it go further up the food chain to like the uh, the ftc the uh, food and drug administration or even the epa when it comes to uh, practically labeling these things on a national basis well, and, and therein lies the problem. The attorney generals are trying to, and I think will pass, a national uh, set of guidelines. But in this area, there are some things that the FDA is responsible, there are some things that the FTC is responsible, and some things that the EPA is responsible. Someone was joking on the news uh, last night that, uh, you know, one agency regulates salmon 
uh, until it's caught, and once it's caught and smoked, it's regulated by another agency. Well, that makes it confusing uh, for consumers and for businesses to understand what's expected of them. Hey, you know, if you just joined us now, we're on the phone with Jeffrey Hollander, who's now back on Green is Good. And if you want to see more of what Jeffrey's up to, you could go to his website, www.jeffreyhollander.com. He just wrote a book called Planet Home. You can buy it on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, Borders, all great bookstores across the nation, and of course, online. Tell us a little bit about Planet Home and why you wrote it and what you want, it, what you want consumers to get out of it. Sure. Um, well, Planet Home tries to do a couple of different things. Um, it is a very graphic book. So, you know, you can open up to the kitchen or the bedroom or the garage and see in a glance uh, the five or ten most important things to do room by room throughout your house. It goes beyond those sort of quick and easy tips uh, to also tell you things that don't really matter, won't make much of a difference. And it takes a much more holistic approach. So one of the things that we do as consumers is, you know, we'll go to the natural food store and buy a, a piece of organic chicken or a piece of organic fish, and we'll come home and we'll prepare it on our kitchen counter uh, that we will have cleaned with a disinfectant because we want to make sure that that counter is nice and clean. Well, the disinfectant is basically made with pesticides. And so what we're doing is we're going to all the trouble to buy organic food and then contaminating it when we bring it home uh, because we've placed it on a countertop that has pesticide residue. And so we really haven't accomplished anything. We do the same thing uh, in the bathroom. You know, we'll go wash uh, and shampoo our two-year-old with uh, a great brand of organic shampoo, but we're dipping them into a tub that we cleaned with toxic chemicals, and we're applying those toxic chemicals because of the residue on the surface of the bathtub to the rest of their body. So part of what we're doing here is trying to help people think a little bit more holistically, a little bit more strategically, and we go not just through the rooms of your house, but we even talk about things like banking. I mean, I, I know lots of people who work for wonderful nonprofit organizations. Their paychecks get uh, deposited into a bank that lends that money out to the very companies they just spent uh, eight to ten hours a day fighting against because <laughs> they're polluting our planet. And so we have to think uh, more broadly, more holistically, more systemically, if we're going to to make progress and get at the root of the problems that we're facing. Gotcha. Wow. So if you if you if you haven't bought it yet, buy Planet Home because it will help you understand the greater needs that we have and how you could participate in becoming part of the solution. Barnes and Noble, Borders, Amazon dot com. So tell us, last time we spoke with you, Jeffrey, you just walked us through, brilliantly walked us through and our listeners through all the different you know, materials in our homes and how really most of the stuff is not even tested compared to Europe or other standards that exist around the world. You were then the CEO of 7th Generation. You've now left. Tell us about the next chapter in, in, in your life. What is it? You know, I've seen you in the news recently. I've seen you all over the media. Everyone that I know that sees you speaking at, at, at big events just says you look renewed again and that you're just your your energy level and your excitement is, is, is greater than ever. What's What's the next chapter in your life look like? Well, th that's, a, that's a great question. And, and, you know, as I reflected after leaving 7th Generation, 7th Generation, like other wonderful companies, Organic Valley, Stonyfield, Patagonia, was an exception to the rules. It did business differently, it did business more responsibly, and it did business more sustainably. The challenge we face is that uh, there are not a lot of exceptions and not enough exceptions to the rule. And my goal, uh, which is really part of the mission of the American Sustainable Business Council, is to change the rules of the game so it's easier for the good guys to win and uh, more likely that the bad guys will lose. Because we've really sort of rigged the game. We've rigged the game in favor 
of a lot of bad, uh, unsustainable activity. And whether that is uh, letting uh, someone who's growing uh, traditional carrots uh, get away with polluting the groundwater, uh, causing a lot of soil erosion, uh, endangering farm workers through the exposure to pesticides, um, those bad practices uh, don't show up in the price of the carrots you buy. And then you have the organic farmer who takes great care with all those things and ends up charging more money. Well, it really should be the other way around. If we forced companies to capture the negative impacts and the externalities of their business, bad stuff would be expensive and good stuff would be cheap. So we need to change the rules of the game. One of the things that makes it so hard for consumers is often good products do cost more money, and it shouldn't be that way. Uh, we're sending the wrong message to uh, America. We spend uh, you know, trillions of dollars subsidizing oil, gas, and coal, and teeny amounts of money subsidizing clean, renewable energy. It should be the other way around. Why does a company like ExxonMobil that is making a billion dollars in profit a week need a billion dollars of subsidies a month uh, <laughs> when they're already the most profitable company on the planet? Amen. Amen to that. And, you know, I've read a lot about, you know, I've read a lot of your writings and your, and I've listened to a lot of presentations you've made and, and you make points about, um, you know the hundred leading responsible brands, or even you've you've pointed out the the Ben and Jerry's, uh, you know, se sellout. And I don't mean that in a rude way, but sellout to Unilever. But in many ways, it really does. It is. It was a sellout, and it frankly feels not as fun to buy a Ben and Jerry ice cream, even though it's a wonderful product, and I think they created a, a tremendous brand. But since they're not running it anymore, it's not as fun to buy it. Same thing goes for you, frankly. You know, you are such a leader, and you've been such one for 20 years, running seventh generation with a real sense and, and purity to purpose. Is it really true, though, when the 100 leading responsible brands turn over and get sold out to the monster companies, um, is, does that dilute, then, the brand? Well... In some ways, you have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis because not all of the acquirers handle these uh, companies in the same way. Yeah. But one thing is categorically true. When you take these uh, very responsible, leading-edge businesses and sell them to a large multinational corporation, they no longer are out on the leading edge they're not as innovative. They don't take the kind of risks that they used to take. And I think that it's bad for our economy that all of these wonderful, innovative companies uh, get acquired. We need another model. Uh, you know, better that they all join together uh, than sell themselves out to large multinationals. And again, it's not always bad, but in most cases, uh, the the mission, the vision, uh, the leadership is diminished when these companies are sold. And, of course, the consumer never knows, because when you go buy Ben & Jerry's ice cream, <laughs> it doesn't say on the label, a product of Unilever. Or when you go buy Stonyfield yogurt, it doesn't say a product of Danone. Right. So the other challenge is that the consumer doesn't really know who they're supporting anymore. Mm -hmm. They go into the natural food store, they go into the grocery store, they think they're supporting these wonderful little companies. And little do they know that they're supporting the same multinational companies uh, that are doing things that they're not happy about. You know, that's a great point. And, you know, since we've had you on the show and we have lots of great entrepreneurs, ecopreneurs like you, thought leaders, what Mike and I are finding, Jeffrey, is that there's a lot, you know, big companies now are really focusing on sustainability and they're creating chief sustainability officers or, uh, or you know, corporate responsibility divisions and things of that such. Can you, sp you know, this seems like a, a wave and a trend that's, that's here to stay. Can you talk a little bit about the business case for corporate responsibility and where we're going as um, you know as as a country and as a world with regards to big business now adopting some great practices yeah 
So there's no question that uh, companies are thinking about sustainability and corporate responsibility. And in some cases, uh, doing very good things. Uh, you know, I am a, a big fan of Nike, and despite the problems they had a decade ago, uh, they have made tremendous progress. Um, so we do see companies moving in a positive direction. The challenge uh, that we face is that most of these large companies look at sustainability in a very, very narrow way. So if we think about uh, Coca-Cola, uh, who is a big user of water, they have a large program uh, with the WWF, World Wildlife Foundation, to dramatically reduce their water consumption. Now, that's a good thing. Uh, I don't want to want to belittle that effort. But what about the product itself? What about the consumption of sugar, uh, the effect on obesity and diabetes? Um, it's wonderful to take a aspect of a product and make it more sustainable, but that is nowhere near good enough. We have to look more holistically at these companies. We have to look at the totality of what they're doing. And that is my challenge to these large companies, which is, you know, don't pick an area of sustainability that is convenient for you to focus on. Step back, do an analysis of your impact, and focus on the places where your impact is the largest and the most negative. And, uh, you know, I, I would not say uh, that my number one concern about Coca-Cola would be its water use. I would say it would be the effect that the product has on health. So that is the challenge that I see. And, again, it's a mixed bag. Uh, some companies doing some good things. Uh, a lot of companies choosing limited areas of impact and making progress in ways that don't disrupt and challenge their overall business model. I'll tell you, Jeffrey, that is just that is a tremendous challenge, and I, I don't know how many multinational corporations are willing to accept that challenge uh, and and just change their whole business model. Uh, I mean, despite the moral imperative to do so, that's that really is that's a tremendous challenge. Well, I think. The, the, the reason that they will um, and the, the business case for sustainability, I mean, I, I can remember five years ago uh, when uh, McDonald's as a brand uh, was facing huge challenges. Uh, they weren't making proper disclosures about the calories and the fat in the food they were selling. They didn't provide any healthy options uh, for consumers who were eating there. Now, I don't want to say that they've solved the majority of those problems, but they haven't. But they started down a path to, uh, you know, they, they could say, well, we're going to be an environmental by recycling the uh, vegetable oil from our French fries and using it as fuel, which they do in Europe. Well, that's a good thing. But they went to the heart of their business, and they began offering salads. They began offering fresh fruit and fresh vegetables. Um, they began being more transparent and disclosing some of the health impacts of the food that they eat. So, again, why would they do this? They did this because they were worried in part about tarnishing their brand, but they were also worried about potential litigation that could come from consumers who suffered from obesity and other health hazards uh, because they ate at uh, McDonald's. So you have to look at the business case. I mean, I think that Coca-Cola should be concerned about litigation and liability that comes directly from the product that they sell. And the business case really is not essentially driven by a moral imperative as much as it is driven by the need to protect your brand to avoid litigation and mitigate risk. I mean, you have, you have uh, you know, insurance companies today who are leaders when it comes to wanting to mitigate climate change because they know 
that climate change will create loss and risk that will be too expensive for them to insure. In some cases, some of the European insurance companies won't even provide insurance to a, a multinational company whose board isn't committed to mitigating climate change. So I think that, that the business case for corporate responsibility is not well understood. It affects uh, your ability to attract and retain talent. Uh, it affects uh, what your health insurance rates will be. Uh, you know, there are companies that are investing hundreds of millions of dollars to keep their employees more healthy, but they're saving half a billion dollars uh, in health care costs. So uh, the business case, I think, is becoming more and more solid. I think it is inevitable that companies will move in this direction. The question is, do they move in a more sustainable direction proactively or reactively. Right. That's brilliant. And, you know, we're down to the last minute, Jeffrey. You know, we could have you on five times a year, and it's not, a, not enough. You've got so much to, to share, and that's important for all business leaders and just citizens to hear. Why don't, why don't you wrap it up and tell us, leave us with some thoughts about 2011, what you're going to be doing, and what others can be doing to become part of the solution. Right. Well, first of all, you know, I do write three to four times a week on my blog, so people that go to the Jeff, JeffreyHollander.com website can get uh, a, a more frequent flow of thinking from me. Um, you know, I think that, that in 2011, uh, politically, we're going to be playing some defense, uh, but in, in, in some ways, my goal for 2011 is to raise my expectations and my hopes higher than they've ever been and begin to tackle some of the big problems, the systemic problems uh, that uh, we really haven't taken on. So instead of going issue by issue, one problem at a time, really begin to think about how do we change the rules of the game so that everyone is incentivized to do the right thing rather than encouraged and often financially incentivized to do the wrong thing. Thank you so much. And Mike and I are so honored that you took the time to come on our show again. We're going to have you back, Jeffrey, of course, because you've got so much to share. Uh, for our listeners out there, go to his great website, Jeffrey Hollander, H O L L E N D E R dot com. Buy his new book, Planet Home, Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble Borders. Jeffrey Hollander, you're a brilliant green thought leader, an ecopreneur, and truly living proof that green is good.